Right, I'm Michael Kay from Taxonica, and my colleague is O'Neill Del Pratt. Um, they say that when actors are playing Hamlet, you should always remember that there's someone at the back of the room who doesn't know the plot. Um, so perhaps there's someone here who doesn't know who Saxonica is. Um, we're the developers of the um, Saxon XSLT index query processor. Um, O'Neill and I developed the product between us. Um, we've got a little bit of administrative support, but, but essentially um, that, that, that's it. Um, we could probably do with a little bit more help, so if there's someone who's got a PhD coming up or something like that and is, 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 is willing to work in Reading, um, then come and talk to us during the conference. We might just have room for you. Um, what we're talking about um, today is the development of um, XSLT in the browser. Um, XSLT in in the browser is really where it all started. Um, XSLT was invented to run in the browser, not only in the browser, but it was certainly seen as being um, the big opportunity. Um, pretty well the first XSLT processor um, was in Internet Explorer version 4. Microsoft sort of even jumped the gun. They, they, they got going before XSLT was standardized. There was a rather false start when they implemented something that turned out not to be the standard. Um, which the world is still recovering from. Um, but the idea of running in the browser was, was, was there right from the beginning. The idea that you serve XML from the server, you render it in the browser, and, and take the load off the server, and, and, and things like that. Um, it's taken a long while for it to actually get there. XSLT1 is now implemented in all the mainstream browsers. You can now use XSLT1 client side, and it will work pretty well everywhere. Um, you have to find some pretty offbeat environments. It works even in the mobile phones and the, the, the tablets and the mobile devices. It took an awful long time to get there, and during that time, the world changed. Um, so what's available with XSLT1 in the browser is very much a sort of um, 1999 view of the web, if you like where you have static content, only it's XML instead of HTML, and then you render it into static HTML on the browser. And if you want to do anything more interesting with your, your content, um, what do you do? You generate, you write XSLT that generates an HTML page containing lots of JavaScript, and all the interesting bits are done by the JavaScript. And so your programmers have to know JavaScript, and they have to generate JavaScript, which is much more difficult than writing it, um, so what do they do? They ignore that and they just write JavaScript instead because it's easier. Um, so XSLT1 in the browser really has not taken off for those sort of reasons. It took too long to get there, it missed the window, um, it didn't um, keep up with the way that web architecture was, was, was developing. Um, so it's not really um, become mainstream. Um, what we decided to do was to try and um, address that. Um, the Saxon CE product, therefore, is not just XSLT2 in the browser, because going to XSLT2 was not going to solve all those issues. Um, the aim is to do much more than that. Um, the aim is to move the technology forward so that you're not only um, doing the XML to HTML conversion in the browser, but you're also handling all the user interaction, all the, all the active programming that people do today in JavaScript to replace all that um, with stuff that you can do in, in XSLT. Um, how's the product built? It's the same Java source code base as um, Big Saxon. We need a proper name for Big Saxon, server-side Saxon, this, the Saxon product that you're, you're probably familiar with. Um, so it's the same Java code base. Um, one of the big things that made Saxon CE possible was the discovery um, that with GWT, the Google Web Toolkit, we can convert that Java to JavaScript that runs in the, in the browser. Um, that was an inspiration that came to me from Wojtek Toman, who I think is, is, is here this weekend, who showed it could be done with Xproc, and I decided if he can do it with Xproc, then we can do it with, with, with Saxon as well. Um, so that was an inspiration. And we had to cut down the Java a lot in size. It's, it's only 
about 80,000 lines of Java, whereas the big product is 250,000 lines of Java. So it wasn't just taking the code and recompiling it. There was a lot of um, adapting it to that environment. Um, and then adding the extensions that are needed in that environment to handle user interaction, to handle animation, um, and to do the things that you need to do to access the, the browser environment, because you can never sort of eliminate um, the, the JavaScript world. You've got to live with that world and interact with it. And a lot of the development that's gone on in, in Saxon C over the last couple of years has been making that, making that feasible, making that possible. So, the first prototype was shown in that beautiful um, conference room over the other side of the river in Charles University um, at XML Prague 2011. It seems a long time ago, doesn't it? And that really was just a prototype, showing that it could be done, showing that it worked. Um, we got as far as a general release product in the summer of last year. Um, Phil Fearon, who's here in the audience, um, was um, working for us full time to, um, to make that happen. Um, so this talk with his very much with acknowledgement to the work that he's done on the product during that time. Um, and the, the, everyone likes to have a product announcement, even though this isn't a salesy conference, but our product announcement for today is that the product is going to become open source in the next release in a few weeks' time. Um, someone asked me yesterday, um, so um, how are you going to make any money on it? answer is, we haven't the faintest idea. Um, we just hope that when we've got a million users out there, we'll find some way of getting some money out of some of them somehow. But the important thing is to have a million users out there. Uh, because without that sort of critical mass, um, we'll, the, the product will never take off. It can't, you can't get something established in the browser space as a niche product for, 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 for 500 enthusiasts. You've got to go for a big mass market, and that means you've got to be open source. So, how are we going to do this talk? Um, we're going to try and get to do um, two demonstrations. They're going to be necessarily be um, fairly fast and brief and not go into, in, into a great deal of technical detail. But just showing the kind of applications you can build with XSLT in the browser. Um, the first one is, shows a, a fairly classic application of XSLT, which is rendering technical documentation. Now, the application space of rendering sounds like traditional XSLT space, but of course, rendering these days has to be much more interactive. Um, you don't just generate HTML and then, 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 then let it go, and, and so we'll show you how, how to do that. And then we'll do something that's much more Web 2.0-ish, if, that, if I can still use that phrase, I know it's gone out of fashion, but, but I, I think people know what, what people mean by it, um, which is the idea of an application in the browser rather than just content in the browser. Um, and so we'll um, be showing a, um, a, a, doing some gaming um, using the product with some interaction and communication over Twitter. So the purpose of these demonstrations isn't just to show you a pretty application, because you could have written these applications in JavaScript, and as you're watching them, um, we want you to think not just this is a, this, this is a fancy um, application that they've built, um, we want to focus on the technology that's used to build it, because you could have built these applications in JavaScript, but the whole point of the, the exercise is you don't have to. Uh, there's a much better way of building them using higher level languages, using a more declarative approach that doesn't go into all the gory detail of low-level coding. So that's the, that, that's the message we're trying to, trying to get across. Um, so um, let's go into the first of those. I'm going to um, show you the first one, which is the technical documentation, and then O'Neill's going to lead on presenting the, the second one, which is the, the chess game. So let's get out of slides and go into actually showing you it. So, can we read that? You can probably read it better than I can. What we've got here is a classic um, view of a, a, a set of documentation, which is the, the documentation, not of Saxon CE, but actually the documentation of server-side Saxon in a... Um, 
in a browser rendition. And the way this is constructed is as a single page application. So there's a single URI um, that gives you access to the whole application. There's just one HTML page behind this. And behind that on the server, there's a whole load of XML content. And the server side, there's no server side logic to this. The server just serves static XML. And this, um, all the logic is on the client side and it accesses the XML on demand as you move to particular parts of the site. And it's using the, um, the philosophy of hash bang URIs. So when I go to a particular page, then I'm going to magnify this um, for you if I can find the right key combination. Um, what we see is that we've got a, a standard URI here, saxonica.com documentation demo, and then a hash bang. So the fragment identifier is then a hierarchic URI about slash packages. Um, and the, the, the hierarchy within the documentation is represented by the fragment identifier of the URI. And the point about this hash bang convention is, is that it's, it's something that Google understand um, and other search engines understand. So um, the content should be fully searchable using the search engines and they should be able to get you direct to the right place in the documentation um, once you implement the right sort of protocols in the robots stuff, which we haven't actually done yet, but, but the whole principle is that it, it will interact with search engines in the, in the traditional way. And it means that you can, as you navigate, we can click on a link there and that will change the URI that we're seeing at the top. Um, we can um, follow links within the documentation or There are a lot of links in the documentation, but I'm not seeing them at the moment. If we go to a page like extensibility, then we can click on links. And every time we click on a link, the fragment identifier changes, but the main part of the URI doesn't. So all the methods of navigating in the site um, cause you to display a new URI as part of the fragments concerned, but stay on the same HTML page. And because you're changing the fragment identifier, the back button works as you'd expect and, and allows you to go backwards and forwards through the site. And you get that just for free because of the way that, that, the, the, that the XSLT code interacts with the JavaScript window environment and it just sets the right properties to, to, to cause the browser history to be updated and for that to all happen automatically. So it's got all the usual ways of navigating within the site um, and it, you know, it looks just like if this had been written in JavaScript. The key thing is, um, this is XSLT behind the scenes. Um, all this clicking on things um, causes XSLT code to respond to the clicks and to change what's displayed on the, on, on the screen. Um, there's almost no JavaScript. Um, there's one little bit of code which does involve JavaScript, and I might as well show you that. Um, there's a search button here. Um, this is one that I did yesterday because someone had a support inquiry on, on the Saxon expression extension function. So I wasn't sure where it was in the, in the documentation, so I can search for it. And I then get a list of where this expression appears, and it's highlighted. And actually that bit of highlighting of where the search terms appear is pretty well the only thing that in, involves a little bit of JavaScript in this site. Um, that could have been done in XSLT, but it, but, but, but it isn't. Um, so the idea is the XSLT and the JavaScript can actually work together. You can call out to JavaScript, just as in a server-side application, you might call out to Java to do some bits of functionality. Um, that search is not doing anything very clever in terms of free text searching. It's using a straight XSLT contains match. Um, the thing that's slightly um, interesting about it is that it's, um, it's searching, it's doing a linear search of the whole documentation. The documentation here is that there's about two megabytes of XML in the main part of the site 
and it's also got all the Java doc information, which is another eight megabytes or so. Um, it pulls that down on demand, so it, you don't load all that immediately when you first see the site. Um, it incrementally loads the XML as you access different parts of the site. And when you do a search, then it has to start pulling down the, the, um, the whole content of the site so that you can search it. But usually, um, that's sort of happening behind the scenes, and you get a, a very fluid user experience in terms of the download time. Um, let's look a little bit at what's going on behind the scenes here. Okay, um, so here's a bit of the XSLT code. It's the top level style sheet. And just to show, there's about eight style sheet modules there. Um, not a vast amount of code, a couple of thousand lines of XSLT code. Our first attempt to do this tried to put the XML on the server in DocBook and to run the DocBook style sheets in the client. And, and, and that didn't work. The docbook style sheets are just too big to work this way. Um, if you've got 100,000 lines of, or 200,000 lines of XSLT, don't try to run it in the browser. Um, because the, the compilation time, just to compile it all and then execute a small part of it, is, 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 is a killer. Um, we know how to solve that problem using just-in-time compilation and only compile the template rules when they're first used and things like that. Um, but we certainly haven't solved that problem yet. Um, but a style sheet, you know, that's a modest sort of size, 10,000 lines, 20,000 lines, is, is perfectly feasible. Um, the actual XML here, the bulk of the site, the XML we're using is actually XHTML. Now, if you, you might think because it's XHTML, there's no work to do, but the, XH, the, the XHTML is sort of abstract XHTML doesn't contain any rendition information. It doesn't contain the table of contents. It doesn't contain, um, you know, all the detailed code for, 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 for the event handling. So it is very abstract XHTML. It uses the new HTML5 elements of, of articles and sections and things like that. Um, and there's pretty well an element in, 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 in XML for everything, in, in XHTML for everything we wanted to do. We had to be a bit creative with some of the things we do, like having boxes. I think we used the aside element. Oh, is it called aside? Something like that um, for that part. Um, the code looks very familiar to an XSLT program, except you find a few unusual things that you probably haven't seen before. Like, look at this. Um, method equals replace content on result document. Um, usually use method equals XML, method equals HTML. Um, well, we've got a different way of displaying results here. We want to, um, our results want to update the HTML. Um, so you write XSLT code whose output is a modification to the HTML page. And so we've invented some new output methods um, for that kind of purpose. And you find various places in the language where we've made um, fairly sort of creative and innovative extensions within the framework of the XSLT standard um, to enable it to work in this, this highly interactive environment. Um, replace content sounds like an update, doesn't it? It sounds like you're having side effects, and, and you are. But again, we're managing that within the scope of the standard. We've used this sort of architecture of XQuery update using pending update lists. So what replace content does is it adds a change to a pending update list and at the end of a transformation phase, those updates get applied to the, to the HTML document, and you don't see those changes until the next transformation phase, which might be processing the next user click. Uh, so there's a sequence of transformations going on, and each one sees the results of the, of the previous phases, but you don't see any updates within a single phase of transformation. Um, so we're preserving the, the, um, the sort of purity of a functional language and the being side effect free in that kind of sense. Um, some of the other things you see, what's this thing? IXSL schedule action. Um, that's the way we do animation. Um, wait one millisecond before, that, that starts a new transformation um, after a period of time. Um, I can't remember why this was done in this particular case, um, but in the browser environment, you often want a bit of asynchrony because 
if something's going to take a little bit longer, like a search, then you want to make sure that users can interact with the, the system during that time. Um, so you'll find little bits of things. Here, match equals IXL window. Um, what does that do? IXSL window returns a reference to a sort of pseudo element that represents the, the window within which the HTML page is displayed. And, and we can access properties of that object um, using an extension of the XDM data model that reflects the, um, the, the, the window model of the, of, of the JavaScript data model for accessing um, things like the, the URL bar and the, the, the back and forward buttons and that, and that kind of thing. Um, so there's an IXSL event here. Um, we can access the current event, the current user key press. We haven't tried to abstract from that in, in, enormously. You can access the properties of the event um, very much as JavaScript presents them using the same kind of, kind of data model. I quite like to go for a much more abstract level of user interface, but at the moment, the, the JavaScript level is what's familiar, what's well documented, and our target user base understands it. So you see a lot of little extensions like that um, to, to enable XSLT to, to, to do the interactive processing. Um, but at the same time, here's another schedule action, this time waiting a decent length of time, um, 200 milliseconds. Um, and, and that's for um, doing an on mouse over. So when you put the mouse over something, it waits the time before showing a hover prompt and that kind of thing. Uh, responding to events is done with a template rule in a particular mode and the mode reflects the type of events that you're processing. So as well as rules processing things in the source document, they process events in the user dialog. So very much uh, it's, it's XSLT, but not as you know it. Um, so I think that's about all that I wanted to show on that. Um, I think if we've got questions on it, save them up till the end. Um, let's hand over to O'Neill to look at the other demonstration. This one involves two people. Yeah. <laughs> right, so this is uh, the second application, the multiplayer chess game. Uh, it, it is strictly a two-player game, so we haven't implemented a, a computer player. And for the communication, those are over, we, we, we send those over Twitter, so the, the players can pr play remotely, and they can even submit the moves via Twitter and the, the application will pick those up as well. This is just a screenshot before we go into the application. Uh, we have an interactive user interface with the, 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 the chess pieces, the board, um, on, on the board. The users can drag and drop the pieces and you can input them in a box and there's also, there's also a move history uh, with apply numbers in, in the chess game. Just a bit on the architecture. Uh, we have a client side component and a server side component. Saxon CE on the client's, client side with a single HTML document, which is just a, a skeleton um, document with empty developments where we render the, the boards in these developments. We have uh, two style sheets to control the rendering and the, and the chess game logic. And a, also a simple uh, JavaS JavaScript file, which we, we've just put all the, 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 the Twitter um, HTTP requests in the JavaScript. So we could have done that within the style sheet, but we thought we'd just leave it to the, we could have done that in the style sheet, but we thought we'd leave that in the, in the JavaScript. On the, the server side, the, we use Servlex which handles the, the Twitter requests and Twitter for J, we've implemented that in Saxon extension function, which we call within the, the XSLT. So let's give you a demonstration. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, I think Mike's got his set up. I'm going to enter two usernames, Twitter usernames. Uh, 
Okay, so I've ticked on the box here. I'm, I'm white. And I've put also the username, of the Twitter username of the person I'm going to be playing. Mike is SNX Chess 2. I'm SNX Chess 1, player 1. Um, this is just so no one gets confused. O'Neill's playing white and I'm playing black. <laughs> what I should also do is show you the, the Twitter timeline. Okay, so let's make the first move. Because this is, we're sending the move via Servlex, I've just put a bit of security on, on this server side there. So the move is now submitted to Twitter. Mike is somewhere else in, a, in another part of the world. And now what happens is that there's some, off there's some out of band communication where O'Neill sends me an email or contacts me on Skype or does something and says, How about a game of chess? And um, I somehow get the message that we're going to start playing. And so on my terminal, I enter who white and, and black is. These SXM chess are our Twitter um, IDs. And I um, enter that I'm going to play black and I request his first move. Um, this isn't done by push. Um, I can watch the Twitter timeline, see when he's playing. You might be playing um, one move every few seconds, or you might be playing one move a day if you're playing someone in Australia and doing a more postal chess sort of style. So you can, it's, it's designed to sort of handle either kind of style of, of play. But I, either way, I can watch the Twitter li timeline. I can see that, see that he's moved. I can get to the move and sh show it on my screen. Um, and um, then I can make a reply. And as soon as I make that move, it sends the Twitter message. And if we're watching the timeline, then you'll see the move appear on that timeline. Um, did you explain the message format for the Yeah. Yep, for the OK. Move? So uh, we can represent the chess, a chess board using 64 characters, which easily fits in a, 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 a single tweet. Uh, the capital letters here represent the, I think it's whites or, or, or blacks, and, and the lowercase represents the other player. We have here the move that has just been made by Mike, and also the, the, the fly number as well. So let's, let's request Mike's move. And there we go. We, his move has been added to the, the move history. Okay, so let's do something a bit more interesting. <laughs> okay, so I'll request that move. Sometimes Twitter takes a little bit of time to deliver it, but um, on this occasion, not. Um, so he's moving there, he's attacking my pawn, I'll come up and defend it. And you see the board history is being updated as we move. Okay. Uh. And don't worry, we haven't got time to run this <laughs> game to, to completion. <laughs> we'll stop after a couple of moves, but it gets interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've taken my, uh, my pawn, I'll, I'll take him back. Okay, so we see here that the, the, this is the, the history you can, we can easily restore the board if we decide to, you know, leave the game for a couple of days, you know, we're, we're sort of... Yes, I could pick up the game on a mobile phone um, by pressing the restore button because the whole state of the board is in every Twitter message. Um, it, doesn't, it won't actually restore the whole history. It could in principle by going back to the timeline. Um, it doesn't, but it w you can restart the game on another device and, 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 and things like that. Okay. Just a bit, a bit more on the server-side component. We proxy, proxy the communication with Twitter using Servlex. And 
you know, Cerberus handles HTTP requests. But the, th the thing is, on the server side, there, there, there's, no gate, there's no knowledge of, of the game. The only purpose of the, the server side is to handle the, the OAuth authentication and to proxy the messages by Twitter. We use Twitter for J, uh, which is a, a Java API, which does the communication with, with, with uh, Twitter. And Twitter for J persists the, the, the data, the, the OAuth uh, data on the, the server. An example here of of a URL or URI which uh, the server will pick up. So if I can. So this URI, is, we have this update status. So Twitter for J, the extension function will, will be sort of maps um, this update status. And we have here the user. We want to we want to update that user's timeline, and this is his status. So he's he's mentioned here, Mary Black, and the move that he's just made, uh, which is E2 to E4. So on the client side, we, we see here we ha we have a chess game application developed using Saxon CE XLT2 processor, single HTML file. And the style sheets renders the chessboard, handles the user inputs, validates the moves, and also sends the moves over to Twitter via the proxy. And it also receives the, time, the timeline when we want to receive um, the, the, the opponent's move. OK, so just see if we can show you a bit of the logic. So we have template rules which match um, for certain pieces that are moved. So if you move a knight, this is a development which matches that. Just, just a point there, we're looking at the HTML DOM here. So we've got a div element, and we're using the extensibility of the HTML DOM with attributes prefixed with data to add our own sort of application data. For, so the model of the chessboard is represented using extensions to the HTML DOM, like the data piece attributes. Yeah. Uh, so it, in, a, in a sense, we're sort of returning a bit more than just true or false. Um, we require more information upon the move that is just made, uh, such as recording sort of castling and, and various moves in the, in the chess game. Let's just go back a second. Okay. A bit more on the vet handling. Um, for certain buttons that are I'll press, the submit button here, there's events on click action which captures that event and it causes the, the template to begin the move. Okay. So that's it. Um, what are the key points there? We're using XSLT in the browser. We're demonstrating what it's capable of. It's handling the user interaction. It's handling a reasonable complex Web 2.0 application running in the browser with a fair bit of interactivity going on. It's handling communication with the server. It's handling XML coming externally from a Twitter feed. The Twitter timeline is coming in as XML, and we're using XSLT to process it. Um, we would have liked to do this application purely client-side without a server component at all. Um, it might still be possible, but we found that the 
the, the security barriers that the cross-site scripting architecture and everything puts in your way uh, were, were, were sort of insuperable. So we had to put a proxy in, in the server to handle the authentication mechanisms and handling the actual communication with, with, um, with, with Twitter, which was slightly disappointing because it means you do need a, a, a server-side component to the, to, to the application. Um, we think with a bit of more work and, and possibly by using JSON rather than XML, we might be able to get rid of some of those cross-site script, scripting issues and that would be another thing to, to attempt. But what it shows is that it can be done, um, that the logic of an application like this can be written in, in XSLT. Um, we wanted to show you can handle the complex user interaction, that you can handle the statefulness, um, that you can handle the, 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 the communication using external services of which Twitter is just a, 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 a particular example. Um, we wanted to show that we've got all the ability to interoperate with JavaScript that we need, while at the same time minimizing the, the amount of JavaScript that you, that, that you actually um, need to write. Um, and so the purpose of the exercise was to demonstrate that that's feasible, and I, and I hope that we've done that. And we've also come in, in time for questions, which for me is absolutely most unusual. <laughs> so are there any questions? Open source means uh, many things. Have you already decided on an open source license? Um, not absolutely definitively. Um, it, I think we, for, there are some constraints that mean I think it will, will stick with the Mozilla license because some of the code, um, there's code that's been contributed to Saxon over the years by external people and they contributed on the, on the assumption it was the Mozilla license. And, and unless we contact all those people, I don't think we can change the license, so it'll probably stick with Mozilla. Um, the other thing that open source means is, does it mean collaborative development? Um, Saxon in the past has been open source, but we haven't really encouraged a community of developers. Um, I'm still thinking on that one. I would quite like to have a, a more collaborative feel to, uh, to the way this technology moves forward and, and move to a platform that, 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 that encourages that. So it's not just us producing open source and everyone else consuming it, um, but, but more of a feeling that there's a community contributing. Um, so how would you uh, manage uh, modularity in your um, client-side code, especially the HTML code? Thank you. Um, there turns out to be very little HTML code. Most of these is just a skeleton HTML page um, with divs, with IDs that you then populate from your style sheet. And nearly all the logic is in the XSLT code. Uh, all you've got is a, a, a you know, a, a bare bones frame of HTML with the fixed content of the, uh, of the page. So we, we haven't seen an application that's got a lot of HTML code. Um, modularity of the style sheet, well, it's whatever XSLT gives you with, with imports and includes. Um, in Saxon at the moment, you, we, we read all the code and compile it as a unit and optimize it and then run it. Um, it would be quite nice to do that a bit more incrementally in the browser environment, but we're, um, that, that's, that's futures. Uh, Michael, I'm wondering um, whether there are any particular sort of killer applications, as it were, for this, any particular areas where you think this would be uh, so much easier than uh, alternative approaches? Um, I think inevitably you're focusing on the things where, where um, there's a strong XML element um, because, you know, let's face it, games developers um, are, are they're, they're all JavaScript script kiddies. They're not going to suddenly switch over. So, so that's a social thing rather than a technical thing. Um, but things that are strongly XML oriented, and the documentation browser, I think, is 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 is, is 
probably the best example of a real application that is the kind of thing that we actually expect users to write and, and get benefit from, um, I think is, 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 is a demonstration of the thing, kind of thing that we, we would expect to see. Um, XML isn't just documentation, of course. There are also other, other fields that are very heavily XML oriented. I mean, you know, you, you take the application that you run to, to submit your tax returns in the UK. It's a little browser-based application that, that, that ends up submitting XML back to the Inland Revenue with your tax return in it. There's absolutely no reason why that kind of application shouldn't be written using this technology. And since you have to update that every year as the tax rules change, it becomes highly suitable to use this kind of technology for, for, for that sort of thing. Yes, I was just wondering when I saw the uh, extensions to XSLT that you made, like the one in the result document, uh, replace in line. It seemed that you are setting a, a de facto standard in that. Uh, you have been in the XSLT committee. Are you thinking about, well, defining a kind of substandard for these kinds of things? Well, there's one other guy doing um, XSLT in the browser. He's here this weekend, so perhaps we can talk to him. Um, I think it's very important to, to um, that standards shouldn't get too standards and, and implementations should remain abreast of each other, um, and I think you know we have to show we, you have to do the innovation first to show what can be done, and then consider standardisation um, when you start to get to the point where there's a serious prospect of more than one implementation and wanting them to. To, to support the same interfaces. So, so yes, it would be nice to see that, uh, but I certainly didn't want to do that first. I have uh, one question. Uh, have you considered it, uh, something like parallel processing so you can run something like Fred or Worker in JavaScript? Um, the browser is, does have a sort of asynchronous, has its own kind of model of parallelism and, yeah. and, and asynchrony, and we live within that. Um, when you fire things off, you know, when, 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 when events occur in quick succession, you do actually get things happening in parallel automatically. Um, and, and that, that seems to work well within that asynchrony model, um, but it's not a, a true sort of parallel processing environment in the browser. Um, but certainly, um, there's a need to work well within the, the particular asynchrony model that the browser has. 